So Carol, tell them about your experience when you went to visit me and they told, they told you I wasn't on the list. I think if you just- Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Kathy, uh, one time when Michael was transferred out of one prison and moved to another prison, um, I didn't know where he was, but I was able to find him and I printed off the BOP policy that said that uh, immediate family had the right to visit, even if they were not on the visiting list. So I printed that, I took my marriage certificate and I went to the facility and I stood at the window and discussed and debated with the guard at the window um, the, the reason why I was permitted to visit, um, even though I wasn't on a visiting list. And ultimately I ended up in the visiting room with Michael, but it was not without standing my ground and using the BOP policies as my best arsenal to um, advocate for that. So I had the policy in hand, I had my marriage certificate and the guard called up to the uh, unit and said there was some crazy woman in the lobby insisting on seeing Michael. <laughs> and it was kind of funny, but at the end of the day, by doing that um, and standing my ground and insisting on holding them accountable to their own policies, I was able to go in and visit. So I highly recommend that you make that effort. So, and, let me, and let me just say what happens. In the, this is why it's so important to understand the policy of the Bureau of Prisons, because there is at every prison, there's going to be somebody who answers the phone and says, no, you can't come. <laughs> That's just part of the Bureau of Prisons. It's not a family-friendly agency, okay? And I don't want to tell you to go without knowing all the complications, but every prison also has what's called a duty officer that's on staff. So the duty officer is much, that, that person is like acting as a CEO when the warden's not there. And what we know is that we can expect to have interference and obstacles, but if you have the BOP policy, and of course we will provide you with that policy today, um, you'll have it. And then you could make a decision. Then you would grab your marriage certificate. Then when you went there, you would expect to be turned away because that's what they do. And then you might say, I want to see the duty officer because I have a right. Here's the policy. Here's my marriage certificate. I am immediate family. And that is how you overcome some of those challenges. Now, you're in the PSR, you're married, you have the right to visit, you have a staff member that probably doesn't know the policy that he wants your husband and you to follow. So sometimes that's part of our job when we're advocating for ourselves is to understand what can we do. And we will provide you with that policy today. And then we could have an offline conversation if you want to call me later and say, and then we'll make that decision on whether it makes sense for you to drive 400 miles to get to LA um, to do that. The, um, so is that okay, Kathy? Yes, no, that works. I, I will do it. I'll also, I also have a copy of the report, which has- Yeah, that's that's what you need. Justin wanted to ask- just, just something as well. Real quick, real quick. Thank you. Like everything we say, you want to consider the pros and cons of- how everything you do will follow your loved one in prison or you. We had a client years ago who showed up with the policy statement and the guard reluctantly let her in because of it. But our client insists every visit was made harder when it was packed. He felt like his visit was ended first. Twice his wife was sent away for inappropriate clothing. So they had to go to the Target or Walmart. So he felt like there were repercussions for his wife showing the policy. So Everything you do may have a reaction with a staff member who may be forced to work and do their job. Just urge you to consider that with every decision you're making. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Carol, you want to say something? I, I just want to kind of follow that up and say, um, I visited Michael for 10 years in prisons of every security level, and I did not ever experience that. So I think that um, maybe that was a, a perception, but Kathy, I wouldn't want you to be discouraged from doing everything you can to see your family. We'll, we'll, we'll get into all those things. I mean, there, there are so many collateral consequences to being a justice impacted person. We all expect as Americans that our government is going to do the right thing. But I suspect a lot of people are on here. They're saying they're uh, they should have been handled civilly and not criminally, um, you know, and, and yet, you know, the decisions that we make, they put us sometimes in this situation and we always have to be figuring out what can we do to, to make things best. And that's really 
the subject of today's webinar. It's understanding when I'm going into that environment, I have to, I should always start by backtracking and trying to remember the first time administrator or the first time I learned that I'm a, I'm a target of an investigation. Uh, and, and you first time you went to see a lawyer and that lawyer may or may not have given you the confidence on knowing what's, what's coming ahead. Okay. Lawyers sometimes are great analytical thinkers, but they're not always great listeners and they don't listen to what's going on in your personal situation. We want to make sure that anybody that's a part of our community always feels that they're getting a good listener and somebody who's going to help them understand these are things that 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 we see happen these are things that you can do and then and then you could use all of your critical thinking skills to figure out what's right for me i was really um adamant about fighting for what i needed to have done while i was in prison and I, I had a different outcome than others because I understood the policies and the procedures and I figured out, okay, what do I have to do to not only get the best outcome in prison, but also have the highest level of liberty when I'm on supervised release and get off of it early. All of that relates to having a very good understanding of the system at the very start of the journey. And if your attorney has not provided you with that information, then this is a great place for you to get it. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am Michael. I've got my partner, Sam and Justin and Clayton and Brian are also on the webinar. I don't know if Larry's on here or not because I can't see all the names, but, but I do want to say that we are very passionate about trying to help people learn how to help themselves. And I'm generally only available on these weekend webinars because during the week, I'm doing this other work to try and change the system. And But I rely on our team and I trust our team. And if they don't know the answer to a question, they're going to ask. And together, we're going to give you a team response. But we're also going to back it up with information on where to go get it, where to get information to validate what we're saying. Like I, you heard me saying to Kathy earlier, I said, hey, we're going to give you the policy and then you could use that policy to learn how to advocate for yourself. Now, the problem that I think a lot of people have is they don't know what questions to ask at the start of the journey because they've never been in this system before. And they are, have been, sometimes they're understandably frustrated. They're wondering, why am I in this system? And I can't answer those questions. I, 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 I can't change whatever decisions were made in the past. What I can do is show you these are things that we can do now to advocate for ourselves in different areas. And I need to, I need each of you to realize you have homework to do. If you haven't been in the system before, you've got to be looking at this homework. And so I've created this, this resource that, <clears throat> that I hope you will be looking through um, today. Uh, I should go to I should go to here. You guys have probably seen our website before, but every day you'll notice we're publishing. Every day we're producing new content. If you don't, there's no way you're going to have time to read and absorb everything that's on here. We have more than a thousand videos, audio files, writing things, but every day there's something new. And today I'm going to be using this this resource as an asset to guide me through here. It's already live on the website. And if you just went to the blog, that's that's how I got to it. It's got a video of yesterday's webinar. Today is a, is a replay of it. I'll, there's always going to be new information because we're going to get new questions from people and we're going to respond to those questions. And if you want to find the answers to them and you don't have time to listen, just click the iTunes link and you could listen to it while you're driving or while you're exercising. But I'm going to be using this PowerPoint presentation to kind of guide us through here today. And you will see that on this webinar where we're talking about this initial adjustment, there are so many things that you don't know because you've never been in that system before. And I need you to at least get some level of basic literacy of the prayer of the prison where you're going. So if you know where you're going, I'm going to ask that you turn over to this website here which is the Federal Bureau of Prisons website. 
And it has an abundance of information that you can use to at least develop your sense of literacy of the, of the agency itself. And I don't only want you to learn about the agency itself, like here it says, Director Peters testifies before the Senate committee. And you can hear the Bureau of Prisons spin on that. But if you go to our website, you will also hear how am I analyzing what she said and how that's going to apply to you. And hopefully that's going to open your mindset to what you have to do while you're going through here. Coming from the perspective of everybody, the collective wisdom of everybody on our team who has been through prisons of every security level, gone through programs, seen um, reform legislation. There's somebody that's not muted. And I'm going to ask if you're not muted to mute yourself so that so that we can preserve a good recording. It's Justin, I think, is not muted. There we go. Um, so so I just, we, we're recording this, of course, so that you can have more insight going forward. And we, we, we want you to ask great questions. We're always, our, we're gonna do our best to respond to your questions, not only today on the webinars or on the weekly webinars, but even while you're in prison, you will get access to our, um, our content through um, our partners, Brian and, and Clayton and Crystal and others that are coming on board with us to help us make sure that your team is being heard. But to start while you're out here, this is going to be the time for you to ask questions on these webinars, because that's really what this program is about. And the first thing I'd like to show you is this one section here of locations. If you haven't been there yet, please go and you know where you're going to prison. Please go to this section here and learn about the prison itself by just clicking on the, uh, the link and, and understanding what, what can I learn about this? What, there's a lot that you could learn from here, including how do I send mail? Somebody who doesn't understand it would send mail to this address and it's just going to be rejected because that's what the Bureau of Prisons does. We have to go in here recognizing the Bureau of Prisons is not a family-friendly agency and it's our job to understand it. In fact, since, um, since Kathy has told me she's going to Terminal Island. I want to look at one thing on Terminal Island right now and see what level they're on. Oh, they're on a level one, which is great. That does mean at least there is visiting there. That would be the address she drives to to go see the prison. But if she wants to send mail there, you, you want to scroll down on this page and look at these sections right here. And I have more information on that throughout this webinar. But the main point I want to cover right here is every one of these prisons has this thing called an a and handbook. I would really encourage you before you go in to read this a and handbook in its entirety, also the commissary list in its entirety, so that you have a basic understanding of how that warden is going to manage that prison. And if you don't know the prison you're going to, then look for something that's similar, just because you're going to have questions about this journey ahead, and we wanna help you answer those questions. We wanna prompt you with questions to ask us. What are we learning through our community of working with BOP executive staff members and people who are serving time in jails and prisons across the country? I have somebody there, before I go on to the next topic, uh, all it says is iPhone, so I don't know who you are, but you can, your hand is raised. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question so that I can respond. Hey, Michael. Uh, so I, I just got sentenced to a 25 month uh, term and the judge recommended uh, two facilities that were near my home. One about uh, 15, 20 miles away and the other is probably about a hundred or so miles away. There's actually five uh, federal uh, Bureau uh, prisons in the state that I live in, in Kentucky, but um, I wasn't sure how soon they notify you because the judge actually just put down a uh, report to the marshal's office uh, by 2 p.m. on November 18th, and um, I, everything that I've been reading online and watching you guys and watching some of your webinars, um, a lot of people say within a few weeks, uh, they get a a certified letter in the mail telling them where to report. 
Uh, so I got two questions. Uh, how often uh, do the, does the BOP actually listen to the judge's recommendation? And two, um, it is uh, that paperwork processed? Um, I have about five weeks left before my report date. Is that paperwork usually processed and you have a uh, reporting institution uh, within that time frame or uh, self-surrender to the marshal's office at the courthouse so, where you were so, sitting? So, so I'm glad that you asked the question for, for because there's there's something relevant in what you asked that it, that relates to anybody who has not yet been sentenced. The best time for us to have answered that question, what is your name, by the way? My name is Robert. Robert. The best time to have answered that question for me to you would have been before you were sentenced. If I could have answered that question before you were sentenced, we could have done some preliminary work, such as identify the institution that is best for you specifically. And then second, created a plan that we would have given to your attorney and, ex and helped your attorney with the language that he could use to request that the judge puts that language inside what's called the statement of reasons. Because the Bureau of Prisons, when they're designating you, what they're going to look at are your judge's recommendation, but also the statement of reasons. If, you, if your attorney simply said, uh, uh, tell him to go to Lexington or to Ashland, because you're in Kentucky, I know those prisons, um, that's better than not saying anything. But had we identified some specific reasons on why to go there, number one, and number two, ask the judge to order the Bureau of Prisons if they can't get him to the place where he wants to go for this reason that would have been articulated in your allocution and in your lawyer's um, uh, sentencing memorandum, then the judge should ask the Bureau of Prisons, please let me know why you couldn't. And our subject matter experts have said nobody in the Bureau of Prisons is going to want to answer the judge. So your chances of getting to that place go up significantly higher. Wow. But we're not talking about that now because we missed that yeah. opportunity. The lesson yeah. here for everybody that's on this webinar is ask questions early because you're going to have challenges and we want to help you fight that challenge at the best possible time. Now, since you've been sentenced, and you do have better than not having it, a recommendation, yes, we anticipate that you will get a letter or your lawyer will get a letter from the Bureau of Prisons identifying the prison where you're going to go. If it's the wrong prison and it doesn't work for you, there's always going to be a response. We've had people, yesterday's webinar, if you listen to yesterday's webinar, you're going to hear some of the people that got designated to the wrong prison, and we had an advocacy campaign for them, and they got redesignated. It's not always possible, but if you don't maneuver, we can't know. All I can tell you now, Rob, is we don't have an answer because you don't have a designation. You're going to get that designation, and when you do, I hope that you're on our webinars and you let us know what's going on, and if it's not what you want, we'll tell you what to do next. Is that fair enough? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Thank well you. One thing um, I'd like to add, Michael, quickly, in my case, and in some other cases, the letter may not come. My lawyers told me I went to BOP.gov. I got my registration number. I called the marshals in the district that I was sentenced, and they told me uh, that I had been designated to, to Taft Camp. So if you go to BOP.gov, put in your name under inmate locator. If your BOP number is there and you haven't been designated, you could just call the marshal's office in that area, give them the BOP number and they'll tell you if you've been designated uh, because some places may not send a letter or your pretrial service officer may not notify you. That was the case with me. I just called them. Let's just, Thank you let's, very much, Justin. Let's, okay. let's take this, um, you know, step by step as, what is your surrender date? Do you have that information? It's, it's November 18th. Okay. So we've got time to be looking at this. Let's just review it um, and then start taking more aggressive action. I would say at the 1st of November. But we'll right now it's, it's best to be to, to know when we're going to fight and then and then start the advocacy campaign then. Um, I, I see that there's another person that's a hand up. I want to I want to say as we're starting this, we're already like 20 minutes into this. I'm very happy to answer Warner Portillo um, if you want to unmute yourself. But going forward, we might want to say, hey, I see there's also a lot of people in the chat 
I've got partners that are on the webinar. I hope that they will be monitoring the chat and responding to the chat. I will be available until we're finished and all questions are answered at the end of the webinar. Um, so, but if Warner, you've got your hand up, if you want to unmute yourself, I'm happy to respond. Yes. So I got sentenced to it 18 months. My lawyer recommended me to go to Cumberland. And then um, it was, did I make the wrong choice? Cause it's a level two. Um, Cum Cumberland, when you say it's a level two, you're going to the camp with 18 months. Remember okay. that prisons, um, they're, the Bureau of Prisons is a big bureaucracy and many of them are what are called federal correctional complexes. So you may see on their FCI or USP, um, okay. that's federal correctional services, then there's FCP satellite. But with an 18 month sentence, is this, do you have a criminal history? No, this is my okay. first one. And is it a um, white collar type crime? Yeah, yeah. You're going to the camp. I mean, okay. just enough experience gives you that information. Still, I will encourage you to learn um, at everything you can. I'm going to, we're going to today, in fact, today's webinar seems specifically geared to people like you who are, who are sentenced and first time in the system. Let's learn about what we have to know. Um, so this section here is, is what I would recommend that you do, um, Warner, is you look at your list of facilities, you go to Cumberland, which is right here, um, and you see that there is a medium security federal correctional with an adjacent minimum security satellite camp. At, when you're seeing level two here, what that means, there's nothing you can do about this. This relates to um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in a, in a demographic area, how the COVID restrictions are. And um, this can change periodically to go from a level one to a level two to a level three. And that's going to influence operations within the prison with regard to access to visiting and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but you're already designated there. So I would definitely recommend that you click on this link, you read the, the a and handbook extensively, and hopefully that will help you ask better questions, um, uh, not better questions, but just more questions that can help you along this path going forward. And I recommend that to everybody that's on our webinars. Make sure you learn, um, but also learn about um, this, this concept of how are you going to live in there? How much does it cost to live in there? How do you get money in there? And so just so you know, at the bottom of this webinar here, you'll see at the bottom of this webpage here that you should have a link to. And if you don't have a link to, you'll get it tomorrow, you'll get it today. Um, you have all this link of additional links to resources. So everything that you're seeing me flip through on this page, it's all available for you right here on this webpage, which you could access really easily. Um, if you, it, whether you get an email from me or not, you could access very easily just by going to the blog and it, and it, and it shows up right there. This is a, um, uh, the webinar that I'm talking about, Surrender to BOP webinar. So make sure that you're looking through there and you look to the bottom and you get your resources so that you, you know what I'm talking about here and, and where to go find the information if I zip through this too fast. And right now what I'm zipping through is the importance of understanding how money works in prison. So to send money in prison, it's not like you know, living in the real world. You have to learn about all of these ways of sending money in prison. And so we've created a rather extensive page for you to share with your family and friends so they know what to do and how to do it. So that you would go to the BOP.gov if they don't have your name and number, they would just get your name and number and, and then they'd follow these prompts as you see down this page, including we recommend that you use the first time at least, use Western Union because that's something that the BOP has got their policy and procedure on pretty well. And if you scroll down, it gives you screenshots with instructions on how to send the money, what's the maximum you can send, um, all the information after you've sent it through Western Union and follow this, you may wanna be receiving money through the mail, but they don't send the money to you in prison. This is where they would send the money. And so you want, it, you want them to understand how to do that that's why we've created these screenshots and everything that you need to know. 
Um, now, how much do you spend? How much money does it take to live in prison? That's information that's going to relate, of course, to your, if you have a financial sanction. Um, I might get out of a little bit out of place here a little bit, but those of you who have not watched our blog and our entry on the, the director, uh, Colette Peters' testimony before the Senate subcommittee last week, you may not know that Congress right now is pressuring the Bureau of Prisons to have a stronger stance in collecting money. So if there was a sanction, a financial sanction, such as um, a fine, a criminal fine or a restitution order, it's really crucial that you understand that fine and how it's going to relate to your qualifications to get early trans transition to home confinement. The senators have actually told the director, what do you need from us to make sure that we're getting compliance from FRP? Okay, what do you need from us? So they're saying, well, they'll, they'll pass a law because right now, FRP, the FRP plan, financial responsibility plan is a voluntary plan. If you don't, if you don't participate, it's voluntary. It's not tied to your good time. It's not tied to the First Step Act. It's discretionary on your part and the Bureau of Prisons part. But the Bureau of Prisons is a very punitive agency. So they are exercising their discretion already to say, if you fall out of favor in FRP, you can expect you're going to get treated more harshly when it comes time to saying, I want to get out of, go to home confinement early. So our job is to help you appreciate the importance of FRP very early. And if you have questions about it, I think by the end of this webinar, we will respond to it because I've got the policy statement that I'm going to show you. And we're also going to recommend a, um, a, a different uh, asset that we've created for you where we retained a former warden. And I interviewed him and specifically spent time with him on FRP. How are you enforcing FRP in your institution? I want you to watch that interview. If you don't know where it is, I'm going to show it to you right now. You would go simply go to our website. At the top of the page, you would see the section here called resources. You would go to subject matter experts. You'd click over there and you'd see here on this webinar, you have all these subject matter experts who are giving you information that you can use. You want to get as absorb as much of this information before you surrender to prison because you won't have access to this in prison, including listening to this fella who used to run the home confinement and halfway house program for the Bureau of Prisons. So you want to hear what, how did he write policies for people for the RRM, residential reentry manager in the halfway house to accept people that you have, you have a responsibility to learn that so that you can advocate for yourself better going forward. This is the one, this is the warden that I interviewed um, about FRP. And so I would recommend you watch that video. And, and I hope if you don't want to watch the video, click on the link and go through the, um, the questions that I asked him. And you can see that there, it's pretty easy to find. Just click on the link and it'll go right down to the space where he gives his answer, right? We try to make this as easy for you as we possibly can, but you've got to be willing to, to go through this work so that you could hopefully ask better questions as you're going through this preparation before you surrender. Now, on the bottom of the website as well, we have this very extensive article that we created, Tips Before Surrendering to Prison. And on this extensive article, you'll see there is a lot of information here. Again, if you don't have time to watch the videos or listen, you could, you could click this and listen to this 20-minute podcast where we're describing it, or you could sit there and read all of this information so that you could learn more about staff hierarchy, about steps that you can take along the way. The more you understand, the better position you are going to be to uh, ask questions. And I know that some of you have questions, um, and I'm going to answer all of your questions. I'm not blowing off. I promise you I will. But if I don't stay on the uh, on this pathway here of where we're going, I, I we won't get through the whole webinar because it's already 9 o'clock. So 
I want you to kind of go through these resources and use these resources early. You, it'll help you understand what's going on when you go there, when you first get arrested, when you first surrender to the prison, what's going to happen. I've covered this on previous webinars, but it's important for people to have this, this understanding of what's going to happen initially, because you're going to potentially be surrender and they're going to talk to you in a way that maybe you're not used to staff members talking to you in a in a in a bad way maybe you're not used to being um spoken to in a patronizing way as if you're a child or um you know just being insulted because that's how the prison system is it's very important to have this mindset when i go in there i know i'm not checking into the ritz carlton I know I'm going to the Bureau of Prisons and I know I'm going to have people that could never talk to me this way in any other situation, but in prison staff members can talk to you in a disparaging way. They can make you feel intimidated. Okay. I am want to assure you where if you're on our webinar, that means you're going to either a minimum security prison or a low security prison. Cause if you weren't, you wouldn't be on this webinar. You would be in custody. So because I know all of these kinds of in, in different institutional levels, I just want to kind of remove this fear that, that exists about going to prison. You're never going to be in danger, okay? You're never going to be in a place where it's dangerous. And although they talk to you kind of hard in prison, you're going to get through this. You've got to muster the strength to know this is just part of the journey and I'm going to get through this journey and I'm going to get through this journey with my dignity intact because I have a plan, a plan to get through this successfully. And I know that they may lock me in handcuffs. They may, they're going to ask me to fill out a bunch of paperwork. They are going to strip search you. Okay. Understand they are going to strip search you, but it's going to last uh, all of, you know, two minutes, if that a minute. Um, some prisons, every time you have a visit, if it's a contact visit, they may strip search you, whether you're in a camp or a low, this may happen. If you understand that, you can say, okay, this is just part of the journey. One thing we put on here, and it was on a previous webinar, but if there's any women surrendering to prison, we did get this feedback that when you wear your underwear, when you surrender, if you go surrender with, Carol, is it white cotton? Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. We heard from some person who surrendered at, at, at Danbury, Danbury, and she went with white underwear, cotton without underwire, and they allowed her to keep that underwear. Another person went to Alderson and they didn't let her. So that's part of the inconsistency of the Bureau of Prisons. Some What works in one prison doesn't always work in the other. We just want to apprise you of what you can do so that you can get the best outcome. We heard earlier from Rob who, who said that his, his lawyer made a recommendation or request to be designated to someplace, but he didn't do some of the other things like make sure it's in the statement of reasons and you put a reason why you're trying to get there. Same thing here. If you haven't surrendered to prison yet and you haven't, if you haven't done your pre-sentence investigation report yet, or you, you haven't been, um, you're not there yet, you still have opportunities to influence things like uh, getting a lower bunk, if that's important to you. If you've got diabetes and you wear special shoes, understanding the BOP formulary so that you can get your diabetic shoes before you go and then advocate for yourself so you get to keep them while you're there or get a, a no standing permit so that you don't have to get a job where you're on your feet all day. These are all lessons that we want you to be aware of and then if you say, what do I do to fix, to prepare myself for this type of thing? These webinars are great places to talk about that, about how you can advocate for yourself. Although you may have a defense attorney right now, once you're in there, you're on your own. And our job is to help you advocate for yourself. We will be with you all the way through the journey. And although your attorney may abandon you, we won't abandon you, but we cannot undo the fact that you're going into one of the most dysfunctional agencies, not my words, but a U.S. senator's words um, in, the, in the nation, and you're not a really strong constituent, right? They, don't, they look at anybody who's justice impacted as being a criminal. And so if we understand that, 
we could say, okay, what do we have to do to make things better? And that's my job is to try and show you. Carol, did you want to offer? I can't hear you. Got it. So, so on the website, we really talk a lot about, we have articles on there about expecting disappointments and obstacles. You may qualify for RDAP. Bureau of Prisons may say no. What do you do in that situation? What can you do in advance of that to qualify? Sam and Justin are great resources to help you in that front, but you've got it all on the website as well. There's just so much information we want you to learn um, because it's a very complicated agency. And, and I can't share everything I've learned in, in, in a couple of webinars, but if you have a question direct, I'm going to tell you what I would do. And that's all I can do is tell you, this is how I would have done it. And I did it in every security level. So it's not luck. I really believe it's strategic. Your, your success is going to be deliberate. It's going to be you architecting a plan and then executing that plan along the way. Um, but I, there are some hands up. So I will break um, since it's already 9.10. And um, uh, Rena's first. Do you want to go first or Justin, do you want to go before Rena? Well, let me go and then we'll have Rena. I just need you to address something because yesterday... I got three calls from clients about to surrender and they all think they're going to the wrong prison. They read something online about this prison and now they regret where they're going. Before I went to Taft, I read this article about Valley Fever and I said, my God, I'll never run there. And you believe these things online. I only served time in one prison. You were in many. And we know some of our clients are going to prison and they immediately want to transfer because they're like, oh, I heard this prison is better and some get there and they're like, no, the other one was better. So people are really obsessed over maybe they're going to the wrong prison. Perhaps you can touch on maybe the similarities of them, regardless of where you are, you have to prepare, but we're continuing to get people saying, I'm going to the wrong prison. I've read it's a horrific okay, experience. Okay, let's, let's, got it. Um, yeah, prison's prison, okay? Anytime you're away from your family, it's prison. Anytime you're away from the people you love and the people who love you, it's prison. But that's right. I was in every prison from high security penitentiaries on the East Coast, even though I was, lived in California, to minimum security camps in Colorado and many in California and transitioned many times. You're going to make it through here. And the Bureau of Prisons is a big agency. I'm a big believer that we control our mindset, controls our experience. Anybody who's thinking one prison's better than another prison is only speaking out of this concept of the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. We have to architect our own plan, fully expecting that the agency is going to obstruct us. If you expect that, then you can say, what am I going to do to make it? Because if you think I'm in Lompoc or Taft and one is better than the other, that's just a lack of experience and hearing from people who are crying and complaining, oh, at Lompoc, they have chocolate ice cream and I only eat strawberry. I mean, you know, that's this is not the Ritz-Carlton. You are going to prison. Oh, God forbid. If you're going to prison, I'm going to show you how to succeed and restore your confidence regardless of where they send you. And that's why we give you these resources to help you learn in a um, what do you call it in a strategic way? I want you to define success, not by what the prison system is going to do, but by what you're going to do. How are you going to get through this? And if you read earning freedom, you're going to see a tremendous amount of strategic, deliberate engineering to get through the journey. If you read one day, prison my 1344th day, you're going to see the discipline that gets you through a single day. If you don't have time to read it, listen to it while you're driving, because we provide you the links to do that. It's all on our website. In fact, I'll just show you where it is. And then I'm going to go to you, Rena, and then I'll continue. But right here, it's all right here. If you go up here to resources, go to our books, boom, you're going to get these likely when you're in prison. I think we send these to everybody in our community, but these are audio files. You could just click those links and listen to it if you want to, and you will see this entire journey. And I guarantee you will find hope and inspiration as you work through it. You can read this one and say, okay, here's a link here where I can listen. If you watch it on the 
the audio or digital version, you're going to hear commentary, but you're also going to see all of these other resources that you can use to advocate for yourself as you're going through this. That's what's super important. The, the attorney, if, you, if you're going to prison, the Bureau of Prisons will not respond to a defense attorney. There's, there is litigation that works against you called the Prison Litigation Reform Act, PLRA, which requires you to do specific things in order to advocate for yourself. And the BOP is not going to be telling you about those, those things. So we want to teach you that while we're here together before you surrender. And that's what this webinar is about, is saying, hey, I've got to educate myself just like you had to educate yourself to become successful in your profession. Whatever it is you are doing, if you're a physician or a business owner or a, um, you know, a, a financial securities guy, right? You invested a lot of time and energy to become the best in the world at what you do. That's what we have to do now. We are going into a system where there's not going to be anybody holding our hands, other, but we will show you, hey, let us show you, give you assets that you could use to learn. And then while you're in there, continue to give you assets to help you, hey, this is what I would do here. This is how I would do it here. Here's an example of what a template looks like. Just modify it with your personal information. That's what we're committed to doing for you. Rena, I'm gonna, I, I, I wanna answer, respond to your questions. I can go on a lot and we will go on as long as I, I will answer everybody's questions. But I do hope that Sam and Justin and to the extent they're able, Brian and Clayton are responding to the comments in the chat. But Rena, please unmute yourself and let me respond to whatever it is you ask. Okay, I have two questions. Um, one, I am scheduled to report um, January 23rd to um, Carswell, Federal Medical Center of Carswell, because I have significant medical issues. Now, I live in Georgia. Carswell is in Texas, and I'm supposed to voluntarily surrender. So do I fly there, or do I, do I report here and they send me there? So that's a great question. And I, I want you to know that this is going to be a personal choice. If you want to know what my recommendation would be, it would definitely be, and you can afford it, fly there and surrender there. Because if you, you, you do have the option to surrender to the U.S. Marshals there in Georgia, but if you do, you should know what's going to happen. They're going to put you in chains. They're going to put you in a detention center, probably in Atlanta. You're going to wait in that detention center until a plane comes on a route, because in the BOP, it doesn't travel like, you know, United Airlines. It means you're going to sit in one place, then they're going to send you to Oklahoma. You're going to go into what's called the Federal Transit Center, and you'd be booked in there and stay there until there's a bus that will take you from Oklahoma to Carlswell. But the whole time you'd be in chains, it's extremely stressful. I went through it many, many times and got through it. But one of the things I can say, and you'll learn this if you read through our content, that is the most stressful time of being in prison is when you're in transit. Because when you're in transit, you are around, it's very um, transient. It's, 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 you're in your trans, it's transient. It's like living in a bus station, sleeping in a bus station that you don't control. Because any, anytime there's movement, you're in chains. You're around people that are of every security level. You won't be, you won't be, I wouldn't say that you're going to be in danger because you'll only be around women, but it's just, you don't know anything. If you, if you could afford a couple hundred bucks to fly out to Dallas or, or if that's the locus, location and get there with an Uber on the same day and you, or sleep at the hotel the night before and then surrender the next morning, you're going to save yourself a tremendous amount of stress. Okay. okay? Second, 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 I want to ask you about that Carlswell designation. Um, did you ask for that specific location? No, I think they sent, I think they sent that because of all my medical issues, which brings me to my second question. Okay. Because yes. I was actually supposed to go in July, but I had um, emergency surgery. So they gave me a six month extension. Well, I have to have another surgery procedure in February. And my lawyer who unexpectedly passed away was in the process of requesting another extension um, for at least another six months. But if they don't give that to me, um, I guess, because only where I can think right now is like, I'm screwed um, because I don't have a lawyer because he unexpectedly died. Um, will the, will the medical facility do my surgery? Well, let, let me respond to both. There's two questions there. You don't have a lawyer, but 
you could still ask the judge for an extension and members of our team will be happy to help you with that. Okay. If you're in our community um, and have you, have you been in our, cause I've never spoken to you before. Are you like, are you in our community of, of, of people? I've you work with Sam, Sam and before, Justin? But okay. That, that's it. So talk with Sam again about um, success that we have had in getting people uh, getting extensions of time before you surrender. You don't really need an attorney for that because if you don't have an attorney, you could still do it pro se and our team will show you the best way to do it. Um, you could also ask for a federal defender that won't cost you money and they, they could help you, but you've got time. So let's let's work that time out. We'll, Sam will tell you what steps to take to advocate for yourself. Um, that was the first question I was answering. You asked me a second one though, and I forgot. Um, if I do have to surrender, will they? Oh yes, will the BOP, if it's determined to be light, how, how long is your sentence? 21 months. 21 months. So there's a couple of things that you could do to use this to your advantage in my view is one, you would want to advocate to get the BOP to do the surgery for you if you really need it within that period of time. Second, you may be able to use that leverage to get home, get to home confinement sooner. So I don't that a lot of that's going to have to do with the CARES Act and how your judge responds, but there's going to be an advocacy campaign that you're going to have to initiate. Um, and supplement that with information like you're describing. My wife, who's the operations part of our company, she's a registered nurse and, and she knows a lot about the medical part. I am too. You, <laughs> oh, you're a nurse too? Yeah. Oh, I can't hear, honey. So so we have a webinar specifically on um, the healthcare. I don't know if I've already done that one yet, but I, my wife is going to send you the policy on the BOP healthcare and formulary okay. and so that you could start advocating for this because it talks about surgery. And, and then of course, we have subject matter experts on our team that used to run medical facilities and so on. And, and they're not on our subject matter expert page because they've asked to not be on there because of their roles, their continuing careers. But we've got a lot of resources that people have to use to leverage. And Sam um, or Justin or whoever you're working with can help you with that. Is, it, is, it, is there another question? Or can I continue with the webinar, Rena? I'm good. Okay, I'm going to lower your hand, Justin. Your hand is still up. I don't know if that means you're you're trying to communicate no, again. I'm, uh, you, I'm going to lower the hand now. Thank you for addressing that issue. So let's continue then with the webinar. And again, I will respond if my team's not responding, able to respond through the chat. You can count on you could you could just unmute yourself at the end. But let's let's keep working through these. Um, these links right here. So I was talking about surrender money. I've shown you where to go and get uh, help your family and friends understand how to send resources into the system. Here's a section that I think is really important. And that is the financial responsibility plan. I'm going to move this link all the way over here. So I have it at the top. Um, I want you to, I don't think you need this. I've already shown you that one. This is the program statement. And again, there's a link at the bottom of this that describes the financial responsibility program. This is program statement 5380.08. It's very important that you read this. If you your judge gave you a sanction for the reasons that I described, you will also see on here, I said, see page 7B, 7B, set page 7 paragraph B. So we're going to scroll down to page um, to that page by um, just scrolling down to page seven, six, seven, and see what it says. There's page seven. Scroll down here to pay to paragraph B. And it says payment. Now, it's very important that I read this to you so that you understand it. The inmate is responsible for making satisfactory progress in meeting his or her financial responsibility plan and for providing documentation of these payments to unit staff. Payments may be made from institutional resources or non-institutional resources. In developing an inmate's financial plan, the unit team shall first subtract from the trust fund account of the inmates, blah, blah, blah. There's a couple of important things in here that you wouldn't probably appreciate if you didn't know the BOP, but I do know the BOP. And I want to tell you, when you see the word shall, 
That means their job description is going to depend on them doing it. They have to do this. The unit team shall do this. Number one, the other section is this section here. If you can see me highlighting, I, I don't know if you can or not, but it says the inmate is responsible for making satisfactory progress. Why is this so relevant? Again, you can find this information just by on, the, on this page itself. Just scroll down to the bottom and you could read it yourself, which I highly recommend that you do. Okay, scroll down there and read that yourself because the, the Bureau of Prisons is going to tie your release date to your compliance with financial responsibility. What does that mean? If you have a sanction, financial sanction, okay, whether it's a restitution order or a fine, they may not tell you what they think is responsible behavior, okay? That's just reality. They, they may not tell you. And if they don't tell you, that does not absolve you of your responsibility to understand the plan and to comply with the plan. So let's say a typical response in prison is, you know, because I've written about it all over the web. And, you know, I used to say in prison, I used to spend six to eight hundred dollars a month to live in prison. But the reason I spent that much was because I was writing a lot. And so I needed to buy access to email and phone and everything else. But today it's different than when I was in, because today the, you've got opportunities that I didn't have. You've got opportunities to influence your way to come home. So I, I had a big fine, but my fine expired while I was in prison because I had such a long sentence. Your fine's going to be very live and there are going to be people assessing whether you are responsible in your FRP payments. So if you're going to expect, expect to live on five, six, seven hundred dollars a month in prison, you better expect to bring in a thousand or more because they're going to want you to be spending several hundred dollars towards your FRP program. My recommendation to you on a personal level is you kind of assess how much can I afford to bring into prison? Kind of get that in your head and particularly how much is going to come into my account in the first six months that I am there. Assess that on your own. I would also encourage you, watch the video I did with um, that former warden, Scott Finley, and do this on your first day of meeting with a team member. So let's say you're gonna, you think you're gonna have $1,000 in your account within the first few months. I would go there in the first few months and say, look, I, I've, and I, don't I don't know how much money you have, right? I don't know how much money you're gonna have coming in there. So you might say, I don't, I've lost all my money while I was in, through this process, but I definitely want to comply with a financial responsibility program. What I don't want to do is make a commitment that I can't make. So I have $1,000 in my account. I don't know how much more is coming. Would it be acceptable for me to sign up for $100 a month for now, it's just so I know that I can pay it for the next several months? And then the next time I have a unit team meeting, we can reassess and see if that's appropriate or not based on how much has come in. I'll always try and be responsible. That's what a staff member would consider as a responsible plan. You have to show you're being responsible. They're not going to try and take everything you have, but most people go in there and they say, well, I got a thousand. I don't want to pay this money till I get out. And so they say, let me sign up for the minimum, which is $25 a quarter. Your case manager is going to look at that as an irresponsible way of responding. They're going to look at this as you haven't given a lot of thought to being a good citizen. So please keep that in mind. If you have questions on FRP, on how this is going to apply to you, please ask members of our team. And then we'll ask you very specific questions like, well, what, what, is your, what does your PSR say with regard to your financial status? Are you worth a lot of money? Do you have income? Do you have businesses? If you do, let's address this accordingly. Because our only goal is to get you out of prison or get you to transition to home confinement at the soonest possible time. I can't change the policy of the BOP. I can't change what your judge sentenced you to. I can't do anything like that, but I can help you understand the system. And then if you understand the system, we can architect a strategy and tactics that you can deploy to get a better outcome. But it all starts with you really understanding this financial responsibility program. And of course, also the release plan which we have an entire webinar discussing that. And so I hope that you'll be on the webinar. If you're, if you're surrendering 
soon and you don't have an ability to go through all of our webinars, there, there's pre-recordings on them, but please reach out to your team member, whether it's Sam or Justin or Larry or um, whoever you're working with on our team so that you can get there. Remember, we've got people that help you on the outside. That's Sam, Justin, Larry, Ash, um, Crystal, Carol. When you get inside, it's going to be Brian and Clayton and, and, and other people that we bring onto the team. So it's important for you to understand how we get you the information so that you go in there ready to advocate for yourself. So you, you want to look at the commissary and understand how that process works. You really want to make sure that you understand the staff hierarchy. And in the lower part of the website, I've given you information on a very extensive article that we wrote specifically for that purpose. So you know, you know, you've got to know, you've got to know what, you know, where I am and what levers do I push or pull. That's what a lot of people don't know when they're going into the prison system. They don't know what levers to pull, right? Like, like you, you, you didn't know when you first learned that the government targeted you for uh, a, an investigation or a prosecution, you probably didn't know all of the different options that you had at different stages of the, what I call the mitigation arc, okay? You didn't know, maybe I have an opportunity to influence how the prosecutor is going to charge me so I get a statutory cap, okay? Maybe you didn't know how to prepare before the pre-sentence investigation report. Maybe you didn't know how to prepare before sentencing. I guarantee you there's a lot of stuff about the BOP that you don't know right now. I want you to learn as much as you can so that you are able to pull the right levers while you're in there. And there's just so much to learn that it means we have to spend time giving you this information so that you can absorb it all so that, you know, there's no way I can tell you everything I learned in 9,500 days of being in prison, but I've written so much and recorded so many videos to help you understand the relevance of these things. That takes me to this thing about to think about on your initial day when you go to prison. You've got to be in uniform every day, every day between 7.30 and 4. You've got to make sure that you have your ID with you all the time, anytime you're outside of your housing unit. Why is that important? Well, in an earlier webinar, we spoke about, I know you don't expect to break any rules while you're in prison. I get that. This isn't for me, and this isn't for you. Your job right now is to be thinking about the staff members in the Bureau of Prisons. Who are they? What motivates them? Some of them, their careers are going to advance based on them doing one thing in their view, and that's protecting security of the institution. What does that mean to a staff member? For many staff members, that means um, that means they're going to write disciplinary infractions for anything they can because they, if they do that, their quota goes up. They look better. So you have to know what's every rule here so that I don't get targeted with some kind of rule that I don't even understand. Maybe you walk from the housing unit to the library, but you didn't bring your ID. So I was just going over there. If a, the wrong staff member catches you there, and they say you're you're in this area and you don't have this stuff with you, they will give you a disciplinary infraction. And if they give you one, it's going to hurt all of our efforts to get you home early. So we cannot overemphasize the importance of all these webinars and learning about the disciplinary code. And what do you do if they do these kinds of things to you? How do you respond? Because it's going to have a direct influence on your, your self-advocacy efforts later. So please um, learn those rules. Make sure that you remember, that, yes, they're trivial. Yes, they'll seem petty, but you've got to learn how to do them. You also have to learn how to keep your family connected to you and build relationships with people. So we've created all of these resources for you here that you could use to send to your to your family and friends, but it's complicated. So when I say it's complicated, it's because you're dealing with the Bureau of Prisons. The, how do you, you're used to sending email and, and somebody getting it in, in 32 seconds. 
but it doesn't work like that in the Bureau of Prisons. So we've got a video here that kind of gives you an example. And I would encourage you to watch that video and share it with your family and friends. Then go through the process. If you have questions, how does it work? Ask us those questions so that we can show you. Simultaneously, the mail in prison. We have a section here, and the link again is in the bottom. Understand things that, that you can have sent to you in prison and what you can't. For example, look at some of the, um, look at some of the, how, how do I get this open? Let me see if I can get this open. Um, I've got to go open it over here. Hold on a second. I want you to see that the idiocy of the bureau, of, the idiocy of the policies. Okay. So let me get out of this. How do I do that? Ah, well, I guess I can read it from here. Look at these. This is the mail procedure in prison. Okay. This is an actual document. Can I scroll up and down? Oh, I can't. Shoot. Ah, okay. Let me see here. I've got to go to grab this. I want to grab this URL. I should be able to grab it, shouldn't I? I guess I can't. Shoot. I want you to, I'm going to read it to you if I can. This is, this is something that, can I? Ah, trying to show, share a screen with you, but I don't seem to be able to do it effectively. Um. <clears throat> Well, I'm just going to tell you, forget it, I'll waste too much time We're trying to read it. Um, in the Bureau of Prisons, there, there are these, all these crazy rules that you don't understand. If you've got a child and your child wants to draw a picture for you with a crayon, and they send that painting in with a crayon, according to that document that I just showed you, the Bureau of Prisons is going to reject it. If somebody writes to you on colored paper, blue paper or red paper, they're going to reject it. If somebody puts a sparkling things, like people try to cheer you up, okay? Or send, if your loved one sends you perfumed email, mail or something like that, they're going to reject it. Make sure you learn all of these things before you go. I can tell you one time I, I was getting people writing me because I, I, I did a lot of work in prison and staff member would call me and they'd say, hey, these people are writing you from the community and they are not on your visiting list and they're trying to come and I'm going to give you a disciplinary infraction if you if they keep writing. you. I can't control what somebody's writing to me, right? If I don't know the policy, I don't even know how to fight that. You've got to learn all of these things, uh, everything you can learn to say, how are all of the ways that staff members are going to work against me? Hopefully you don't have that problem. You don't have any problems, right? But hope is not a strategy. The only thing that I can tell you where I'm going to feel like I failed you is if I didn't prepare you for everything that's coming. And I, I have to tell you, there's, there's a mountain we're going to climb and we're going to climb it together. And I'm going to give you resources to fight it, but I need you to be with me on that and learn and do your own homework. And every day, I promise you, we're going to publish new information on the website to help you understand various aspects of this wretched system that I agree you shouldn't be going inside of there, okay? If you're on this webinar, that means you're fine in the community and they should have given you a civil sanction. And you should, if you have to go to do something, it should be on home confinement, but, but it's not me you have to change. You have to, I have, that's what my job is when I'm not on these webinars, is creating that change. But right now I need you I am telling you, it's very important for you to go through and learn about all of these things so that you can apprise the people you love and the people who love you about these challenges ahead. If you're going into the RDAP program, for example, I want to make sure that you understand, hey, there's a possibility that, that, they, that the staff members will say no to you, even though you qualify, even though you've done everything possible. Well, make sure you read this policy. Make sure you talk with Sam and Justin and say, is all of your paperwork in order? Do you have a plan if they give you a problem? Do you know what to do if they tell you you didn't qualify? If you don't read this policy, you won't even know what questions to ask until you're stuck in there sitting across the table from some bureaucrat that is that may not want to be there to help you right? I hope you don't have that problem, but I'm certainly not going to tell you everything is going to be peaches, you know, and, and whipped cream because it's not. It's the Bureau of Prisons. 
And the more I understand that system, the more effectively I can advocate for myself. That's what our team is here to help you do. But I, I'm recommending, please read through the information that we are providing on these webinars and then use that information to ask us questions. But for RDAP people, I really urge you to read this program statement and then ask Sam, am I okay? Ask Justin, am I okay? If you're going in there and you wanna know about what programs qualify for earn time credits, make sure you look through this document right here. If you have not been sentenced yet, make sure you look through this program right here and say, well, what programs are available and where are they available? So that you might be able to use this as a resource to help you get to the location where you want to go. So these are all assets that are helpful to you along this journey, but you have to remember the agency in which you're going to serve your sentence. So here's a great asset under here about the final rule regarding the First Step Act. You could see it's extensive. If you read it, you might not you might not understand it all. But I guarantee you, if you read it, you are going to be in a better position to ask us questions that we can use to help you. And Sam and Justin and Larry and and anybody else on our team, I know they're great people who can help you. Um, but you you have to be willing to do this on your own. I, I frequently write about the importance of journaling because, and that's on a lot of our webinars, because you've got to memorialize this whole process. The more you memorialize your process of what you're doing before you go to prison, while you're in prison, it's going to help you. Remember, if you're on our community, we're here to help you until you're done, until you're on the other side of early termination of supervised release. But every decision you make going forward, every one of them is going to have a direct relationship on your pathway forward. And the one thing I promise everybody is I never ask anybody to do anything I didn't do while I was in prison and that I'm not still doing now. You, you, you heard me talking about the importance of, of documenting the journey. You can see how I document the journey. This is just one month where I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and lo lower this here. But all of this work that you'll see me recording on here, these are this is what I'm doing every day, documenting all this, all the content that I'm creating to help justice impacted people. Where are we publishing it? YouTube, Vimeo, TikTok, websites, right? Everywhere, because there's just so much stuff to do. So you'll see this getting populated every single day. Um, and, and that goes on month after month where we're always producing this information because we want you to see this is what I did to get through 9,500 days in prison. It's what I've done to recalibrate and rebuild my life since I've come home. It's what I use as a resource to help other members of our team understand how do we communicate. And everything is free on this website. Everything. You, you, if you, if you, if you hired us through white collar advice, they're the ones who sponsor my work at the nonprofit, but I produce it all. You'll never see a request for payment or anything like that on prison professors. This is all from members of our community and it will continue while you're in prison. So we want to make sure you're understanding that so that we can help you. And now that was kind of the end of my prepared presentation. I'm sorry for going a little bit longer on the prepared part, but this is the part where I'm gonna go over to responding to any questions that I didn't ask. So if you have questions, please feel free to um, either raise your hand, which you can do at the very bottom of the screen, or just unmute yourself one at a time and I'll respond to anything. But I'm gonna be looking while I'm waiting to see if somebody unmutes themselves, I'm gonna scroll down this chat and see if everybody's question got answered. So how do I do that? Um, Clayton, perhaps providing her with a copy of the visitation report might shed light on the sporadic protocols. Um, Clayton, I don't know who you were responding to. It looks like that was to me. Um, I, I, I'm assuming I can see all of the messages here, but feel free again to just unmute yourself if you have a question. 30, 
Hey, Michael, I, I, that was, that was a recommendation upon uh, Jody who had some extensive concerns uh, regarding some visitation issues. And I, I directly sent her some information, okay, but great. if you want, if you want me to shed light on anything real quick, I, I can do that as well. What, what I think is better, cause you don't have to do it for me. I want members of our community. We have quite a few people on this webinar. I see one hand up. I'm going to go ahead and just, you can, I'm going to mute you Clayton because it's sure. not for me. It's for the people. We're sure. here for the community. If the community has a question, please do what we just see. I, I, the iPhone says there on my screen, all I see is iPhone. I'm going to yeah. yeah, unmute it's, yourself and let me respond to your question. Okay, Michael, it's, it's Robert again. And, Hi, Robert. and I just had a, um, another question. I have three eight-year-old children and um, I remember uh, around that same age, I used to visit my father in prison and he was in a state institution and it was extremely scary. Uh, and I've remembered that my entire life. Um, so uh, my feelings at this point is if it's if it's the uh, same or similar situation, I probably don't want my uh, children visiting me. I don't know how I'm going to handle that. Um, and, and I don't know what that, that situation looks like at this point in time. I'm just wondering if any of you guys have any advice uh, about uh, how were your children affected uh, by okay, visiting got it. you? Uh, we got it. Yeah. Sam, 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 I, I think you're raising your thing. Go ahead and respond to him, Sam. Hi, Robert. First of all, my children were, were older when they came to visit me. However, in a camp environment, um, now this is all pre-COVID, when kids used to come of all ages, uh, they, they either had a sectioned off like little picnic area outside where you could eat or inside. It's a very uh, relaxed atmosphere. It's not something that they're going to walk in and necessarily go through metal detectors. And, and it's not uh, something that's scary. Uh, at the camp where I was in Miami, and I have much more limited experience certainly than Michael, it was every weekend there were young kids, there were older kids, and there was a play area for kids. So with I have no other place to, to, to compare it to but that experience. And it's certainly, I would encourage you, uh, your children to come and visit you uh, because they'll see you're okay. My wife used to say to me, it's amazing. All you guys here look so much better than all the women standing in line. You're, you're healthy, you're tan. Um, so th that was my experience with children and families. Okay. And that's- Thank that's, you very much. That's helpful. And and I think the there's a, there's, if you haven't read Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I encourage you to read that book. There's a one section in there where he talks about the importance of seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. So when you get to the prison, because Sam is accurate, he's telling you about one prison, what the experience was like. That's one prison and prisons are different. And so you want to get there. You want to talk to some of the people there and say, hey, what are you doing with kids? And, and, and you'll get a better insight, a better insight on how to make that decision. Because every, every person has to make that decision on their own. Our job is to try and help you get, make that decision from an informed perspective. So learn as much as you can. Um, if you haven't read the books that we produce for you, I really encourage you to do that so that you can get just broaden your understanding of the system. Um, but that, thank that, you. That, Michael. Thank you. Um, Rena. Uh, question again. So my husband is supposed to be getting out under the CARES Act either in December or January. My question is, and he signed up for several programs. Is he eligible for any earlier days under the other programs in addition to the CARES Act or just because of the CARES Act? No, he just under the CARES Act, that's all he's eligible for for early release. Well, let's talk about what the CARES Act is, right? The CARES Act is an executive order that is a direct response to the pandemic. And it's a phenomenal program. More than 11,000 people have already been transitioned to home confinement. That's very different from other types of programs in the system, like statutory good time, which really reduces your sentence length, or RDAP, which re can reduce your sentence length. Um, the CARES Act and the First Step Act, to an extent, have more to do with, well, no, First Step Act also reduces your sentence but they have more to do with getting you home. What was your husband's sentence length? Both of us, 21 months. And how long did he serve? He's been in there since August the 11th. So he's going to get home in, in 
February, you said? December or January is what uh, his case December, manager said. October, November, December. So he did great. He got the best outcome, which is 25%. That's really a victory. It's the same victory I hope for you. And it's the same victory I hope for everybody that's in our community, because you're not going to get better than that. Um, and then if he gets home, then the objective then will be, how do we work to get him a highest level of liberty when he's home? Mm -hmm. So all of that is information, but no, he, if he's got that date, the best thing to do is just make sure he's FRP compliant and he's staying out of trouble and he's going to classes mm -hmm. and he inks that and gets out. But that's, that's a real victory. I'm very happy for your family. Second question. Um, do you know anything about the furlough days? I know what the furlough policy is. Okay. The furlough policy is in the Bureau of Prisons. You, the Congress has given authority to a warden to authorize furloughs when people are within two years of their release date and they have out custody or community custody. But that's a discretionary call. It's every warden has that discretion. Some wardens by policy don't like to give furloughs and you don't have a right to it. He's got the right to give it to you. You've got to be building a strong release plan and somehow show why a furlough is in your best interest. Now, I think I need to write an article about furloughs because it is a very important subject to anybody that's going to a camp and how they work and what you can do. But more also, what am I learning from my work on the advocacy side in interacting with the Bureau of Prisons on how they're deploying furloughs and how they're being used? Um, in, in your husband's case, he definitely qualifies. I don't know. The best thing to do is to ask, he's in Montgomery at Maxwell? Yeah, he is. Are they giving furlough? Is the warden there granting furloughs at Maxwell? Yeah, he said the case manager gave them the forms. Great. So, and typically they'll they'll grant you either eight hours the first time or 24 hours or depending on how far you're going. Um, are you looking for him to get a furlough or something? Yeah, because he was asking me about it. And I had saw some information um, in the Bureau of Prisons information about the furloughs because, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of, we were trying to be proactive after the fact because we didn't find out about you guys until after we were already sentenced. So when he got sentenced, we had already filled out the visitation forms and everything before when we knew where he was going, we'd already filled everything out. We were trying to be proactive. So we had filled the visitation right. forms out and everything. Um, so Did that work? Yeah. Good. Because some yeah. prisons, just so you know, for other people who are on there, some prisons are really, um, really bureaucratic and they will not, they'll only allow you to fill out the form from the prison itself. Now, how do they know if you filled it out for the prison itself? Because the counselor will write his name on it. Mm -hmm. That's the idiocy of the of of the of the of a big bureaucracy. Some people just want power, okay? And if I'm a counselor, I said, "Oh, I only want them to fill out this on my form." So he'll write, you know, Jones on the top right-hand corner and then he'll copy it. So you can't even write Jones. It's got to be in his handwriting. I mean, I'm so glad that that worked for you. And if anybody else wants to try that on our website, we actually have the visiting form and you can just download it. And that's try where it. I got it from. Yeah, yeah, that's where I did it. Yeah. Good. And then my last question, and then I'm done right now. Um, with me and him being co-defendants, I filled the visitation form out. Well, he told me that the warden had to approve it. What has been your experience with situations where people have been convicted visiting other convicted felons as well? Yeah, family members are, If you, it's not only visiting, Sometimes people are in prison at the same time, so they can't visit, but they can, policies you can't write with, with, with somebody um, that's on your case or, or, or something along those, you can't communicate. But the Bureau of Prisons does have the ability to override that. And all that has to happen is you would ask the warden at your institution, he would ask the warden at their institution. As long as you both have done that, they can grant you access and you can communicate directly. Um, to each other without violating any rules. When it comes to visiting, again, the warden has discretion, but it's not only going to be the warden that's involved in this situation because your husband is still going to be on under some form of supervision. He's gonna be under the supervision of the BOP that's going to be outsourced to a case manager in a halfway house. So do you live in the same, obviously you live in Texas, no, you're going to be, I, you're going to be incarcerated in Texas and your husband's going to live in Georgia, right? Yeah. They're not going to authorize him to go to Texas. Okay. That's just, they, but 
it's not, they're not going to authorize him to get on a plane and go to Texas while he's on home confinement. And he's going to be on home confinement. No, what about me going to visit him now? Right now? He, yeah. You're going to need to get permission from your uh, pretrial detention. What do you call that? Okay. Probation officer? Probation officer. And off, ask him if you're allowed to go out of your jurisdiction to go visit your husband. That's the first step. Then the second step is you're going to have to write to the warden there and explain everything and try and get permission. That's going to be kind of a long tail process. Um, our team can help you on recommendations on what I would do. It would be, first of all, get permission from your probation officer because you're going to want to submit that with your request. Second, I would go to the Bureau of Prisons website and look at Montgomery or Maxwell, whatever it's called. And you're going to see on that website um, an email address for what's called the executive assistant. And you're going to want to write to the executive assistant explain your situation. We're co-defendants. We've been married for this period of time. Um, as part of our release plan, we really want to keep our family together. And I'd like to come and visit him with permission from my probation officer. Here's that information, right? The more transparency and open you are in providing that information, the better off you're going to be. And you may even ask the federal judge for say that he doesn't oppose. I would, if it were me, I, and you've got a little time because I know you don't surrender, you said until January or so. Okay. I would write an advocacy letter to my prosecutor and say, would you at least not oppose this so I could go see my husband? Second, I would write a letter to my judge. Would you write a letter that authorizes me to do this? Third, I would write a letter to my probation officer and ask him to say it. I would gather all that information first because you want to ask in the best possible way. Then I would write a letter to the, I'll show you where to go, right here, um, right here. Go to this section right here on BOP.gov. And I would go here to locations, list of facilities. I'd go to Maxwell. Is it called Maxwell? Maxwell, Maxwell. It's called Montgomery. Montgomery. Okay, so go to Montgomery. And you see right there, it says executive assistant. Uh huh. The executive assistant is the information officer for the prison. He reports directly to the warden. He has a lot, he or she has a lot of authority. So I would write to that person right there. And, but I would want to make my request as strong as possible. I wouldn't just want to do it haphazardly. So first I would write to the judge, the prosecutor and the probation officer and gather information from them and then write your letter um, and, and send it all to the executive assistant and then send it also to your husband and have him send it to his unit team but it's okay. really good for you to do it because okay. you're the one that's still free. He's already there. So that's okay. what I would try. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Melissa. You can lower your hand, Melissa, and, and ask your question. I'm happy to respond. Hi, I just had to unmute myself. Um, sure. I had a question in regards to FSA credits um, that my husband is not earning at the time. So he started the remedy process. Mm -hmm. And he got a response on his BP-9 that he is earning his time that he's entitled to, um, but the computer doesn't reflect that. When I look up his time, his date hasn't changed. And my question was, should he continue to the BP-10 to confirm the, that he is accruing it? Well, let me ask you some questions. How long is your husband's sentence length? He was sentenced to 18 months and right. he is... 11 days shy of six months. Um, he's in prison now. Yeah. Where is he? <laughs> Berlin, New Hampshire. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you something. Actually, that's a great, I've got a, we just got an email from somebody in Berlin. I meant to share this on the, on the. On... That's actually probably my husband. Um, is his name Sean? Yes. Sean's awesome. I was going to use him as a great example. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Um, can I read this permission? Yeah, you go ahead. I mean, this is an amazing story. Has he been a part of our community for a long time or do you know? No, I just joined your community two days ago. Well, I'm glad you did. And I have watched probably 15 webinars in 24 hours. Okay. I'm going to read your husband's email because I'm so impressed with him. Okay. And I meant to use him as a, and, I, and I've got it shown here. Um, this is what he wrote. Sean Heron, self-surrendered to FCI Berlin. In New Hampshire, after a couple of days of having my first team with case manager Morgan Allen Elaine, I went down to the garage to inquire about a job as a basic auto mechanic. I started my first day of work at the garage on April 28th. 
which was 10 days after my arrival at the facility. I had been working at the garage Monday through Friday, the current day. My duties there are to provide pre preventative maintenance on all the perimeter vehicles, dump trucks, backhoes, front end loaders, skid steer, um, trucks. It's just an amazing work job he's got. The duties include all oil changes, tire changes, checking on topping off fluid and washing inside. Other duties include repairs to these vehicles, as well as brakes, rotors. I have received a prison issued driver's license to operate all these vehicles as well. A couple of months back, I also took on a second job as one of the PM cooks in the kitchen, which has the responsibility to cook dinner for all the satellite camp inmates and serve the dinner as well. I work this job mostly seven days a week to help me pass the time here faster. I am only required in the kitchen five days a week with a long weekend off every third week. During my incarceration, I've also signed up and finished multiple classes and am currently active in two additional classes as well as on a waiting list. The classes I've passed and currently in and on the waiting list are, and it gives a list of those classes. You will see that all of those classes show up on that um, section I put at the bottom of here, which are approved classes to get FSA credits. Those are First Step Act credits. credits. Then he goes on to list, as listed on my individual needs plan program review here, I have maintained clear conduct. I have continued to make progress through programming that is available at this time. And I have received favorable performance evaluations from all work detail supervisors. I was originally told by my case manager that he could put me in for home confinement or halfway house, but he only is one time to choose which one. I have never been incarcerated before. And I didn't know a house, so I broke it out. I can put you in for 120 days of halfway house or guarantee you 56 days of home confinement. Not knowing and being uneducated in the program, I chose halfway house to get out of prison and close to home as soon as I could. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to say, what is your name again, Melissa? Melissa. Your husband's doing really great. I want to explain a couple of these things here because he said the, the case manager said I could only give him 56 days of home confinement. Do you know why that is? Um, he said that that was the absolute max that he can get yeah, but or you, he can take. No, Yeah, I got it. I, I got it was one or the other. But do you know why they could only give him 56? That's like yes or no. Do you know? If you don't know, they I'm going to tell that you. That's the absolute max they can give. And even in a halfway house, the absolute max they can allow is four months, which is 120 days. Okay. So I'm going to talk about that for a second. And we'll have a separate webinar on these subjects. There are a lot of prison reform movements. Okay. One of them is called the First Step Act. One of them is called the Second Chance Act. And they're kind of weirdly named because the Second Chance Act is actually 10 years old, whereas the First Step Act is only a few years old and still being rolled out. Right. Under the Second Chance Act, people in federal prison have the right, they don't have the right, the Bureau of Prisons can send anybody in the federal prison to a halfway house for the last year of their I, sentence. I learned that Sam had let me know that information yesterday. Okay. But I but don't know home, the steps to help him or have him That's do. okay. Let's walk it through a little further. Home confinement under the Second Chance Act is limited to the last six months of the sentence or the last 10% of the sentence, whichever is worse, or whichever is lower, right? So your yes. husband only has an 18-month sentence. So the and he most, completed six months. So he yeah, but, but it's the sentence length that determines home confinement eligibility, okay? So that's why the case manager is saying the most I can give a maximum on home confinement is 56 days. On the flip side, your husband can get more time in an RRC based upon the credits he's earning. That computer system they're talking about where you're not seeing the date advance, it's because the BOP is, the way it's interpreting things right now is that if a sentence is eight, if a person is within 18 months of their release date, that release date becomes fixed. And that means you're not going to see that date change. What you okay. may see, what you may see, Melissa, is he may be able to get to the halfway house sooner under the First Step Act, not the Second Chance Act, the First Step Act. What is his month? What is the month right now that he's going to come home or get out? So his release date is July 12, 2023. And with the 120 days halfway house that they said that he has and was granted is March 15th, 2023. March 15th. So that's quite a ways from now. 
Right. Are you working with Sam? Yes. Okay. Has Sam given you the release plan um, kind of template and strategy? Um, so I just talked to Sam for the first time yesterday and he, um, my husband was hooked up with you guys' email within the last 24 hours and he's going to begin working with Sean because ultimately it's Sean's job to do that. I mean, I can assist, but yes. Let, and and you'll, are you going to be on all of our webinars? Like every week? Yes. Good. Because I send the, the link I'll out, but I want you to be on the one for the reentry plan. That's important. Okay. There's a, there's a previously one that's yes. already on our link that you should, you could watch and you could get the template and Sam can help you with it. Um, I don't know if we can help him get advanced that, but I think we can try. I would also encourage you to watch the subject matter expert interview with John Gustin. He used to run the halfway house. And when you're, when the staff are telling your husband, when the staff are telling your husband, he doesn't qualify for more, let's get to know the facts and then see if we can't have a plan to address those facts together. Okay. I think you've gone out of, you've gone out of um, commission or, or I can't hear you anymore. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Victoria. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hello. How are you? I'm good. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, one, is there a limited number of days? Uh oh, I, I unmuted you. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what I did. <laughs> Let me unmute you. There we go. Oh, okay. You're there there you go. Yeah. I'm coming. I'm in Berlin, New Hampshire, so it's a horrible service. Okay. okay. Um, I, there's actually somebody else talking right now. Can I can I come back to you in a second, Melissa? Hello. I I can't. Victoria, go ahead. Yes. Um, first question is, is there a limited number of days that you can earn through the First Step Act? Yes. Not, not by the year, but let's say someone has a 48-month sentence. Um, potentially, then they would be able to cut it down to 50%. Well, if they take every class or every day in there, they take a program. The, ma the maximum you could earn under the First Step Act to get a sentence reduction Okay, that's different from transitioning to home confinement. A sentence reduction, the maximum is 365 days, so one year. Okay, so it's the maximum is one year only. But, but, okay. but that is not the same thing as saying you can go to home confinement earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's different. And right now, that's a very big, um, there's a lot of advocacy work going on on that front today because of the, what the Bureau of Prisons is doing by, by putting this 18 month cap on fixing release dates. I don't think that will hold. I think that we'll see changes in that. I know that our team will be working to change that, but I, as of today, what exists today, the BOP fixes it at 18 months. So when you're in 18 months, anything you weren't on First Step Act is going to apply toward the back end of your sentence, meaning transitioning you to home confinement, not reducing your sentence length okay so, but um so there's a maximum on reducing the sentence but the the credit you earn will be applied to your home confinement to get Correct. you out earlier yes if it's if it's more than 365 days you still get it it just applies to the um the home confinement the not home confinement. reduction of your sentence okay got it okay Are, did you and, say your sentence is 48 months no, my is 24 months. Only. Okay, 24. So in your case, um, you know, a lot of that is going to be getting to home confinement because you're, you're, you're only sick, really close to being within 18 months of your release date. Yes. Okay. okay. Oh, Did second another... question. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to add my book list to the Amazon list and for your, um, you know, the, your daily journal, yeah, I saw that there were like three different versions on there. I wasn't sure which one we, would be the best one to use. I would start with number one. Is that what you're going to have sent in when you get to prison? Yes. We'll send that to you. Don't worry about it. That's part of it. We'll send it right Carol. Yeah, it's already scheduled to get sent to you as soon as you get there. Oh, okay, so what, what will you be sending to me when I got I'll, there? So I know so I don't order ahead. You'll get Earning Freedom as a soft cover book. That one I already got. You don't need to send it. Um, well, you can pass it around. It'll be helpful to okay. other people there. My okay. 1,344th day. Okay. You'll get all daily journals, one, two, and three. And then we, we'll send you stuff all the time, Victoria. Okay. 
Okay. Don't, don't okay. you don't have to you don't have to buy any of our books. We'll send them to you. Okay. Okay, awesome. Can can you ask okay. Carol to send me the uh the one million dollars journey? The which first? one? Your book on the uh, how to make one million dollars after <laughs> one million dollars, yeah. We'll send yes. you this is this this is our newest one. Can you see okay. this for you? This yes. is I'm very excited about this one. This one's gonna be in all the prisons um in the federal system. We're really working hard to do to get this one in. Um, I'll send you one of these too. This is going to okay. be great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Is there somebody else have a question? Okay. I was what? wondering if we could touch back. I have better. Yeah, Melissa, now. let's, let's touch back. Go ahead. So, um, after speaking with Sam, he said that Sean would be better off going on the second chance act. And I used your calculator. And if I put all his numbers in, right, it said that he should have come home on September 23rd. Okay, so and what, you used a calculator that probably, uh, yeah, yeah, but that calculator, I, I'm going to guess that you're are you using the calculator that's online, that's on our website. Yes. Okay. I want, I need to, we need to redo some more work on that because you're using one that, that we published before this 18 month rule came into place. So we have to, uh, I'm going to connect you with our team. Um, so that we could get the right information for you. And we'll talk to you okay. offline to kind of show you, okay, because because that that was the one that we were using until the BOP came up with that whole 18 month rule. But we will still work to help Sean. Um, and I'll write to him directly today because I've got his email. So I'll write to him explaining that today as well. Okay. What, and, and I want you to know, um, Melissa, that even when he comes home, there's more work to do because we want to make sure that he has a high level of liberty when he comes home. What does he do for a living? Prior to this chat, he worked for the post office. Um, but since then, he's began a new career and he still has a job when he comes home and he works in insulation. He went into construction. Okay. And does he work for himself or for somebody else? He works for somebody else. Okay. And that's great that he already knows. We, we want to make sure is that he doesn't have any interference from a probation officer or from the case manager in that halfway house in the reentry center that may say, oh, we only want him to be in one place at a time. I mean, there's so many more challenges ahead. We've got to prepare for all of those challenges because sometimes they'll say, oh, construction, you move from house to house. We don't want you to do that. We got to get ready for all those things as well. And when you're doing your release plan, we'll kind of get all that stuff teed up. Okay. Okay. Uh, nice. So do you think he should continue in the process with the um, BP-10? Because I, the I, I, I'm going to need a little bit more information. Let me write to him directly and I will include you on the email okay. that I send him. So you know what I'm sending and then we'll make that decision after I have more information. Okay. So, all right. One last thing and then I am done. They said the reason why he doesn't see his credits yet is because he's graduating the RDAP program in two weeks. He's on week 10. Oh, this he's in with, RDAP? Yes. Oh, he's not going to get, let's, that's, that, I would not be doing administrative remedy then. This is, that's a very, I thought you said his sentence was only 18 months. Yeah, but he got into the program and he's in week 10. This upcoming Wednesday will be week 11 and on week 12, he graduates it. Uh, that's not RDAP. That's not RDAP. RDAP. That's the, that's, that's and the RDAP. Yeah, that's what the non-residential. So he's not getting time off his sentence for that. Oh. That, I mean, no, no. Okay. He'll get it from the earned time credits. He won't get the same thing as the people that are in the residential program. That's a different thing. Okay, I might have, I mis misunderstood that. Yeah, there are so many ways to get misunderstood in this system, Melissa. You're not alone. <laughs> so well, what will he get for doing this 12-week program? Or he's getting earned time credits. So, which is? Which is should qualify him for more halfway house time. That's why I want to write to him and find out where he is. And then we'll yeah. talk about what to do next. Okay. Yeah. No, Sam has made that very clear that you guys are going to communicate with him because he knows way more than I do. I'm just out here advocating for him. Good for you. Um, Good for including, you. Everybody... I emailed, I emailed the regional office and that's the only reason why the executive assistant um, even replied to my email because I went ahead of that and went to the regional office and then they, I saw the email chain go through where the regional office told Berlin to answer my email. Good. Okay. 
Well, let me write to your husband. Um, I know that Sam would have your address. So we'll make sure that we you also get a copy of exactly what I sent to him. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you all, everybody, unless there's somebody else. I think I lost service again. Yeah, I'm going to mute you. If anybody else has a question, this is the time to ask. Otherwise, we will wish you a great weekend and connect next week. I don't remember what next week's webinar is, but we'll be, ready. we'll be prepared. We hope that you come prepared with your questions. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of our community.